Welcome to today's lesson, an introduction to Mendelian genetics. Before we begin, we're going to travel way back in time to the 19th century. People used to think that the hereditary material must be some type of fluid. Males had a type of fluid, and females had a type of fluid, and that fluid contained all of the information about our traits, and the fluids got mixed together, kind of the way black coffee gets mixed with milk, and the resulting offspring was a blend of the two parents. This is called blended inheritance. However, there were problems with this idea. Charles Darwin himself didn't buy it, didn't make sense, because there were real contradictions in nature. For example, if you cross a black horse with a white horse, the offspring aren't all gray-colored horses. And we see this with people, too. So look at this man. He's got dark brown eyes. He's a father. The mother also has dark brown eyes. And then their baby, poof, has these blue eyes. Those blue eyes are clearly not a blend of the parents' eye colors. So there were mistakes with there, there were problems with this idea, but nobody had a better explanation until this man came along. This is Gregor Mendel. He's known as the father of genetics. Genetics is the science of uh, heredity and the mechanism by which traits are passed from parents to offspring. Gregor Mendel was a monk. He lived in a monastery. He taught high school, and he also cared for the monastery garden. But he was also a scientist at heart. And he liked to do experiments with pea plants. He started breeding thousands of pea plants, and he kept detailed records of all of his crosses and how traits were passed from one generation to the next. He basically came up with a basic good explanation of how inheritance work, and he became known, as we mentioned earlier, the father of genetics. So why were pea plants such a good plant to study? And there are several reasons. First of all, pea plants have contrasting traits. A trait is one of several forms of a character. So one example of a contrasting trait is Mendel looked at plants that had pea plants that had purple flowers and pea plants that had white flowers. Those are contrasting traits. Or pea plants that were tall and pea plants that were short. Those are contrasting traits as well. The other thing about pea plants is they can self-pollinate and they can also cross-pollinate. So this is self-pollination, cross-pollination. Plants, flowers typically have male and female parts. So this is the flower of a pea plant. And if um, the pollen from the male part of the plant is used to fertilize the female parts of the same plant, that's called self-pollination. And if the pollen from the male part of the plant is used to fertilize another plant, that is called cross-pollination. And the third reason why pea plants were such a good plant to study is because they grow easily and they grow quickly so that Mendel could look at many generations in a short amount of time. Mendel spe uh, specifically looked at seven different features in his pea plants. Here they are. So he looked at flower color, purple and white. He looked at um, seed color, which came in yellow and green. He looked at seed shape, which came in round and wrinkled. Pod color, which came in green and yellow. Pod shape, smooth and bumpy. Flower position, mid-stem versus the end of the stem. And finally, he looked at tall plants versus short plants. So these were all contrasting traits. Mendel's first experiments involved um, a monohybrid cross. And we'll, look, we'll take a closer look at what that means. But it's a cross done to study one pair of contrasting traits. The first thing Mendel did was he allowed the plants to self-pollinate for a few generations to produce a true breeding generation. He then crossed two of that generation with each other um, with contrasting traits, such as purple and white flowers. And then he finally allowed the first filial generation to self-pollinate and produce new plants, which became the F2 generation. So I know this is really confusing, the F1, F2, and I'm going to show you that on the next slide, what those things mean and clear it up for you. So this is how Mendel began his experiments. He took purple flowers and self-pollinated them for a bunch of generations until he created a pure, true breeding generation that was reliably always producing purple flowers. He did the same thing with the white plant until he created a true breeding generation of the white plants. And he called these the, we call these the P generation, P for parent generation or parental generation. The next thing Mendel did is he took the purple plants and cross-pollinated them with the white plants, and he created what's known as the F1 generation. You want to think of the F1 generation as the children, but it would be funny if we called plant babies children or babies, so we call them the F1 generation. It stands for first filial generation. And then the third part that Mendel did is he allowed these plants, right, the F1 generation, to self-pollinate, and he created the F2 generation, really like kind of like the grandchildren. 
And what Mendel noticed here is all of a sudden the white flowers showed up again. So the, the F1 generation had no white white um, flowers, but in the F2 generation, there was this weird ratio of three to one. So three purple flowers to one white flower. And he did other experiments as well. So he looked at the pod color and he found the same ratio again. So three green and one yellow. And we're going to take a look next time at this specific ratio and why Mendel kept seeing it. But we're going to take a look at some vocabulary and some basic genetics today. So inheritance in modern times. DNA wasn't proven to be the hereditary material until the 1950s, but Mendel discovered its units, which we now refer to as genes. A gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a protein that is used to express a trait. Individuals who have traits in common uh, carry the same genes. The DNA sequence of each gene occurs at a particular location on a chromosome, and that location is called a locus. So where on a chromosome you find a particular gene is called a locus. So for example, right here at this locus is a gene that makes a large protein called fibrillin 1. If you have a mutation right at this locus, that could result in something known as Marfan syndrome. And Marfan syndrome is characterized by heart problems and vision problems. Here are some other chromosomes. This is chromosome 19, and here are the loci that are on chromosome 19. So right here, for example, is the gene for brown hair color. Right here at this locus is the gene for, uh, gene for green, blue eye color. This is the X chromosome, right? And men and women both have X chromosomes. Here is a gene. Um, if there's a mutation here, it can cause hemophilia. So the locus is where a particular gene is located on a chromosome. All right, so summing up Mendel's theory, Mendel said there's two versions of a gene that combine and result in one of several possible traits. Allele is the name of a version of a gene, and it's a really important term. Uh, one allele comes from each parent. So you want to think of alleles as, as different versions of the same gene. And out of the alleles, we have dominant alleles and we have recessive alleles. The dominant allele is an allele that is fully expressed whenever it is present, and we use a capital letter to indicate the dominant allele. A recessive allele is an allele that is expressed only when the dominant one is absent. And we use a lowercase letter to indicate the recessive allele. So let's look at an example. Right? We have homologous chromosomes. Our, all our chromosomes are paired. Here are the genes. This gene is for eye color. And you can see that gene comes in different flavors and different versions. We call the versions alleles. So these are the different alleles for eye color. This one is an allele for brown eye color, which is dominant, so we indicate it with a capital B. And this is an allele for blue eye color. And we, this is recessive, so we indicate it with a lowercase b, because brown eye color is dominant over blue eye color. So even though this person has a secret little blue eye allele, it's not going to be expressed because it is recessive. So the individual in this particular case with this, what, what is known as a genotype, ends up having brown eyes. Here's some more terminology. Genotype is the alleles that a person has. It's the actual information that's inside of their genes. That's the genotype. Phenotype is the trait that a person has. And it's, it's often the physical appearance. So, for example, your eye color is your phenotype. Genotype determines phenotype. Homozygous is uh, an individual that has two of the same alleles for a certain gene. So, for example, you can have two of the same. So, two alleles, two capital letters, two alleles for, like, brown-eyed color. Or you can have two little b's. That is called homozygous, two of the same. Heterozygous is an individual that has two different alleles for a gene, so one dominant and one recessive. So let's look at some examples of how this works. So right here, we have a person who is homozygous dominant. They have two dominant alleles, and these are both telling, um, both have the information of brown-eyed color. So this individual is going to, this is the genotype, the two Bs, and the phenotype ends up being brown eye color. This is an example of a person who's heterozygous because they have two different alleles. They have one brown-eyed allele and they have one blue allele. In this particular case, we use the rules of simple dominance and the brown eye color wins and masks the blue eye color. So we end up with an individual who has brown eyes as well. 
And in the third and final example, you have an individual who is homozygous recessive. So they have two of the same, that's homozygous, and they are recessive, so that's two lowercase b's. And this individual is going to express the blue-eyed trait. So I hope that was a helpful introduction to Mendelian genetics. Next time we're going to look at test crosses and how Punnett squares work. Thank you so much for listening.